trees have captured the imagination and represented the unknowable for thousands of years. Trees have crossed dimensions, created magic, and even controlled the elements. Of these famous trees, the most popular are stories of world trees. From ancient legends to modern video games, world trees continue to play an important part of our culture. Join me on a road trip across Northern California as I seek out the world trees of reality. Together, we will bring tales into the real world. Hi, my name is Aiden Sattler and welcome to WYSIWYG Vision's very first virtual panel. I'm super stoked to have all of you with me today. If you're joining me from Azalea's virtual con, I hope you're having an amazing weekend and definitely getting your tails fixed. I cannot wait to see you all in person again. Now, it's been a really rough year and a lot of us feel it even more around conventions where we're supposed to be hanging out with our friends and nerding out. So I wanna try something a little bit different with this panel. Instead of me bringing all of my research to you like I normally do, I want to bring all of you with me as I go on a road trip to conduct research about world trees. Hopefully it'll make it a little bit more interesting for you and I have a few surprises along the way. Now before we get much further, there is a spoiler warning for Tales of Fantasia, Tales of Symphonia, Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of the New World, and Tales of World Radiant Mythology. If you haven't played the games and don't want to be spoiled, stop the video here and go play the games because they're really, really fun. But don't forget to come back so you can join us on the road trip. Now, without further ado, make sure you grab your road snacks, get your fuzzy blanket for naps on the road, and absolutely bring your very best road trip playlist. And let's get going. All right, let's see here. I got my masks, hand sanitizer, water, keys, and a full tank of gas. Time to hit the road. philosophy that a good road trip always starts with a good cup of coffee. So I'm heading over to Steady Eddie's, one of my favorite local coffee shops, so that this project can start out right. Right there, Steady Eddie's. Let's do this. All right. I got my coffee. Today is an Irish cream latte sort of day, and I think the perfect way to kickstart our road trip. I hope you have your cup of coffee and tea with you as well. Now, before we can start exploring the real world world trees, we need to have an understanding of how the world trees are used in the Tales of games, uh, specifically in the Azalean timeline, which covers Tales of Fantasia, Tales of Symphonia, and Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of the New World. Now, the thing about the Azalean timeline is that it is really long and really complicated. The timeline itself covers thousands and thousands of years, bending the laws of nature, time travel, space travel, multiple timelines, it's, it's a lot. And I could easily cover hours just talking about the Azalean timeline, but we don't have hours. So I'm going to try to break this down into the main bullet points that we need to know about the world trees. First thing to know about Tales of World Trees is that there are multiple Tales of World Trees. The original World Tree came from the Comet of Darius Carlon, that is the original home location of the elves. The elves emigrated from Darius Carlon to what was then the dead world of Azalea. And when they did, they brought with them a cutting from the original world tree. They planted that and that became the Great Carlon Tree. It was the Great Carlon Tree that revitalized Azalea, brought summon spirits, magic, mana, 
et cetera, et cetera. Tons and tons of time passed. There was a thousand year war, there was strife, there was magic technology, a whole bunch of like world changing events. And the great Carlon tree ended up withering and dying. After a lot more events, the great Carlon tree was replaced by the Yggdrasil tree. That's tree number three. And it's the Yggdrasil tree that we see going it from the Tales of Symphonia games into Tales of Fantasia. Now the fourth tree came from Tales of Fantasia. So the original world tree on Daris Carlon ended up dying again because of war and Magitech. And so Daus went from Daris Carlon to Azalea after Demon Keen and more massacres and Magitech and world plot stuff. Uh, Daus was given a great seed from the Yggdrasil tree, which he was able to go back, bring back to Daris Carlon to plant and become the fourth world tree. So those are the four world trees that we know about in the Azalean timeline. The main purpose of the world trees in the Tales of series is to produce mana for the sustenance and prosperity of their worlds. That's what allows magic and summon spirits to be a thing and the world to just grow and live. The caveat to this is Azalea, after Tales of Symphonia 2. At that point, Ratatosk, the great summon spirit of the great Carlon tree, changes the laws of nature so that Azalea is no longer dependent on mana to prosper and survive. The other difference and good th thing to know about the world trees is that the world trees do not connect between different worlds. Um, however, the mana that they produce can be used to access these worlds. For example, in Tales of Symphonia 2, Niflheim was once sealed away. The seal was broken, reconnecting Azalea to Niflheim. Ratatosk is able to use the mana from the Azalea tree, from the Yggdrasil tree, Azalea's world tree, to reseal Niflheim. So while the Azalea tree itself did not directly connect to Niflheim, the mana that she produced does allow that connection to exist. The final thing to know about the world trees in the Azalean timeline is that the world trees are able to transcend time and space, or at least their summoned spirits are able to use the world trees to transcend time and space. So think about the end of Tales of Symphonia. Lloyd had just reunited the worlds of Silveront and Tethayala into Azalea. And before planting the great seed to grow the Yggdrasil tree, Martell shows Lloyd and Colette a vision of a fully grown, beautiful, strong world tree. Martell promises that if Lloyd and Colette continue to adore and love and protect the Yggdrasil tree, then Martell would protect all of the people of Azalea as compared to the original Carlon tree that was planted only to protect the elves. And now think about the beginning of Tales of Fantasia. Crust is out hunting in the forest and he comes across a dead Yggdrasil tree. However, while the tree is dead and there shouldn't be any summon spirits, Martell is still able to speak with him and Mint and give them a vision of a fully grown, gorgeous, beautiful, healthy world tree and send them on their mission to revitalize and heal the Yggdrasil tree to bring magic back to their world. All right, so that is the super fast rundown of the Tales of World Trees. Again, if you want a more detailed description and synopsis of the Azalean timeline, let me know in the comments below. But that is the nuts and bolts of what you need to know to start looking at some real world mythology. So if you're ready, let's hit the road. Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, which, believe it or not, is right over there. 
across the bridge. The Golden Gate Park is home to the Botanic San Francisco Botanical Gardens. Established in 1880, the gardens sit on 55 acres of land and house over 9,000 species of plants, which is pretty incredible. Lucky for us, two of the trees that we're looking for are among their collection, so let's go check it out. The thing about Golden Gate Park in San Francisco is that you must know how to parallel park if you can find a spot to parallel park. Made it to Golden Gate Park. So you can tell it's a bit chillier right next to the ocean. So I had to wear my extra layers. Golden Gate Park sits in the heart of San Francisco and is often compared to New York City's Central Park. But believe it or not, Golden Gate Park is 20% larger than that. Uh, so we're now on our way walking towards the Botanical Gardens. Super exciting. All right, we made it in front of the Botanical Gardens. We're about the gardens that they're separated into different geological regions. So we'll be going all across the world, all across the globe, to look for our two trees. But first, a very important stop to make. Pretzels! Botanical mm. Gardens is one of my favorite places. There's just so many places for you to picnic and hike and hang out. It's always a treat to visit. So the most direct connection to the Tales games to real world mythology is through the Yggdrasil tree. According to Norse cosmology, the Yggdrasil tree is the center of the world and in fact is the center of the universe. All life connects to the Yggdrasil tree. Without Yggdrasil, there is no life. And it's this huge, massive tree and depicted with bright branches that extend out in very strong roots. And these roots, in fact, connect to three different worlds. It's part of the, you know, world tree. The first root connects to uh, Jotunheim, which is the land of the giants. So think of it as like monsters and tales terms. The second root connects to Asgard, the home of the gods. And the last root connects to Niflheim, or the underworld. In addition to that, the rest of the branches and the roots connect to the rest of the universe, specifically the nine worlds of Norse mythology. The Yggdrasil tree provides life and provides nourishment, and in the case of tales, mana. So without the Yggdrasil tree, the worlds, the realms of the gods will all die. So, the Yggdrasil tree is usually depicted as a mighty ash tree. Huge, strong, with branching leaves. And I'm dropping my mask all over the place, but that's okay. So it's depicted as a mighty ash tree. And worldwide, the ash is a pretty common tree. It's usually found in uh, Europe, Asia, and North America. There are 45 to 65 different species of ash tree. Uh, but the species that is believed to inspire Yggdrasil, specifically known as the European ash, or the common ash. So that's what we're here to find, a European ash tree. I mean, bamboo is cool and all, but this doesn't really look like an ash tree. Time to keep going. Let's move on to Ragnarok. Ragnarok was believed to be the end of times. According to Norse mythology, Ragnarok would be foretold by the trembling of the Yggdrasil tree, which befell all across the cosmos. At that point, all of the worlds would go into war and conflict with each other and destroy each other. However, Yggdrasil would still survive and the new world and the new time would be reborn around Yggdrasil, which is pretty interesting. South Africa. I think I'm a little off course for Europe. Time to keep moving. 
guys, we did it. We found the European ash tree. So if any of you are looking for it in the botanical gardens, it is found in the temperate Asian region of the park, right here. Um, <laughs> Fun fact, it's not signed. Uh, so it made it a lot harder. We walked past this tree several times before we were able to ID it. Luckily, it's just starting to flower right now. So that was a dead giveaway for us. Pretty fortunate, I'd say. Now, like we were talking about before, the Norse Yggdrasil tree was inspired and was inspired by the European the European ash tree. This is a fairly young ash tree. As it gets larger, it'll develop a great thick trunk, and these branches will branch out and sweep down to either side, almost like an umbrella. And that's how the Yggdrasil tree is depicted in mythology. And if you connect that to the Yggdrasil tree in the Tales of series, that's also how the tree is depicted. A very strong, broad tree. Now, a big difference between the Norse Yggdrasil tree and the Tales of Yggdrasil tree and world trees is that in Norse mythology, the, the Yggdrasil tree did not produce mana like it does in the Tales of games. However, both trees are essential to maintaining the life of their worlds. For the Yggdrasil tree, it is by connecting all realms and the nine worlds in the cosmos. In the Tales of Games, it's by producing mana. That said, the Tales of Yggdrasil tree still played a very important role in connecting the different realms and the different worlds in the Tales of series. For one, the mana produced by the world trees was essential in creating bridges to different realms or sealing those realms off. If you'll harken back to Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of the New World, the seal to Niflheim had broken and the demons were coming out to cause havoc and destruction. Uh, the world tree, so Mortel and Ratatosk, were essential in resealing Niflheim to protect Azalea. So in that way, the world tree did connect worlds, but more of create, made, provided the means for which those worlds to be connected. So let's change gears a little bit and switch from the Tales of Azalean timeline over to Tales of World Radiant Mythology. In Tales of World, the world trees act a little bit different than the Azalean world trees. In Tales of World, each world is lives on a world tree. The world tree is central to that world, to maintaining that world. Now, the worlds aren't connected through the world tree, but are dependent upon it for life. Now, as you will recall in that game, um, the antagonist of the game went through to try to assimilate all of the other worlds and the mana from all the other world trees into his own, becoming the ultimate ruler, all-powerful, as you do as, a, as an antagonist. By the end of the game, the protagonist uses his own world tree to help regenerate the rest of the worlds. His world tree produced fruit, and each fruit became one of the assimilated worlds. Now let's take a look back at Norse mythology, Azalean mythology, and Tales of World mythology. In all of these mythology, in in Norse mythology, there is only one Yggdrasil that connects all of the cosmos. In Tales mythology, we see multiple world trees throughout the course of the games. In Tales of Azalea, you end up with four world trees, but they all derive from the original world tree on Daris Karlan. In Tales of, Ra uh, Tales of World Radiant Mythology, you have tons of world trees throughout, connected to each and every single world, but by the end of the game, all of those trees had consolidated and were reproduced by a single world tree. It's just a really fun correlation to think about. Now, earlier we talked about Ragnarok, or the end of the world. The interesting thing about Tales of World Radiant Mythology is that it is essentially a retelling of Ragnarok. 
worlds are destroyed as their Yggdrasil tree, as their world tree is destroyed over and over and over again. But then their worlds are reborn and are born anew by the Yggdrasil tree. So the Yggdrasil tree, the world tree, once again is the bringer of life, but also the fosters the new world after the destruction of the old. Now, like I mentioned earlier, there are tons of stories of world trees across all cultures. The ash tree just happens to be the one from Norse mythology. Now it is time to wander the gardens to find the others. Come on, let's go. So there are a lot of world stories and myths about world trees in Mesoamerica. But as I was researching them, they kept one kept coming up more than the others from ancient Mayan mythology. The story was first discovered in a temple complex called Temple of the Cross. So there were three main temples in the complex. The first, so you had Temple of the Sun, Temple of the Foliated Cross, and Temple of the Cross. Of the three, Temple of the Cross was the most important. It was the largest and had the most reliefs and writings and imagery on it. In that temple, there of course was a cross. Now initially they thought this was a cross, but then they discovered that this was actually the world tree. And in this case, it was represented by a Saiba tree. Like we saw with the Yggdrasil tree, the Saiba tree, the Saiba world tree, was believed to be the center of the world. Um, and it connected the three realms, the realm of the sky, the terrestrial world, so our world, and of course, the underworld, Zibalba. However, unlike uh, Yggdrasil, the Saiba tree was only the world tree for our world itself. It didn't connect the cosmos or the entire universe. Rather, it was the gateway between the heavens, the realm of the sky, and Zibalba, the underworld. Hey look, I found the ancient plant garden. We might be going back thousands of years, but we're not going back millions of years. I don't think our world trees are here. Time to get going. All right. We did it. This one was even harder to find than the ash tree, but we have the Saiba tree. You can see it right behind me. It is a very big tree. As you can see, it looks a lot different than the European ash tree. The European ash tree had lots of nice flowing branches that came down. The Saiba tree is a little bit different. It has a very straight trunk and a high differentiation between the branches that cluster at the top and get very tall to the roots down below. And that really plays a part in how the world trees are viewed different from Norse mythology as compared to Mayan mythology. All right, so the Saiba tree is a really big tree. More than any of the world trees you're going to see thus far, this one just screams world tree. We could barely get it into the frame for this YouTube video. But if you look at the tree, like I mentioned earlier, you have a distinct definition between the branches and the roots with the trunk in between. And that really screams two different worlds, a separation between life and death. Now, if you recall, the world tree here, the Mayan world tree, represents a separation of world and realms. The branches reach into the realm of the sky, or the heavens, the realm of the gods, if you will, while the, while the roots reach down into Zibalba, which is the underworld, while the terrestrial stays near, the mortal realm stays near the trunk. Now, the interesting thing about this, as compared to Yggdrasil, is that you're just looking at a separation of life and death, rather than a connection of the cosmos or a connection of the universe. Instead, it's much more metaphysical. And you kind of see this, especially in uh, Dawn of a New World, where you have a separation of life and death. In that case, the Yggdrasil tree provided the mana to separate life and death. Azalea, 
from Azalea from Niflheim. In this case, in Mayan mythology, you have a separation of life, the realm of the sky, from death, Jibalba, separated by the mortal realm. An important role of all the world trees that we've talked about thus far has been separating the realm of the living from the realm of the dead. You see that you saw that in Yggdrasil, separating the mortal realm from Niflheim and really separating Niflheim from all of the realms. And you see that again here in the Saiba tree, separating the heavens from mortal to Zivalba. You see the same thing in the Tales games, um, especially in Dawn of the New World, where the role of Yggdrasil is to provide mana to help Ratatosk to seal away Niflheim. Now, in that game, in a lot of cases, it was the most important role of Yggdrasil was to provide this mana to separate life, which was Azalea, from death, which was N Niflheim, the land of the demons. Although, to be fair, that's largely because of the existence of the Eternal Sword. But I digress. The importance of all of this is that you have a separation of worlds. You don't have worlds corresponding with each other. Everything has to be separate because they have different laws of nature and you have different roles for each world. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the Tales games as well. The different worlds that are separated, Azalea from Niflheim, have very distinct different roles. And in some cases, the same thing that can be seen in Tales of World Radiant Mythology where each of the worlds is independent from each other, although still very important in the whole of the cosmos. So those are all the world trees here at the Botanical Gardens. It's time for us to hit the road again and head into Solano Valley. Although, I'm pretty sure we have time for a quick pit stop that you're gonna really like. San Francisco is known for many peculiarities and oddities, but did you know that there is a herd of bison living in the center of San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. No, not in the zoo, in the park. The very first bull and cow were transported here to Golden Gate Park in 1890. Since then, more and more bulls were transported from the Great Plains to the park. I wasn't able to find out exactly why, but somebody thought it was a good idea. Over the years, this herd has been instrumental in repopulating the bison on the Great Plains. Over the years, over 100 calves were transported from San Francisco to the Great Plains, which allowed them to rebuild the, the bison population. But today, it's a really fun side stop. Well, we better get going before we hit traffic. Oh, hey, we hit traffic. We are on our way to the Puda Creek State Wildlife Preserve outside of Lake Berryessa in California. Now, those of you that speak Spanish can start laughing hysterically. Don't worry, I completely understand. We're out here looking for oak trees. Now, believe it or not, there are over 500 different species of oak trees worldwide. Oak trees specifically are known for being, for being able to grow very large. They are very strong, they're very resilient. And as you can imagine, that had a pretty profound impact on uh, lots of different cultures. I sifted through so many different stories from Celtic to Native American, Germanic, ancient Greece and Roman. And I was able to find a couple of stories where oak trees were the world trees. So let's, let's go out and take a look at them. standing in the foothills near Lake Berryessa. The lake is actually just behind the hills right behind me. Now, last year, this was the site of one of the largest wildfires in California history. 
As you recall, in 2020, the entirety of the West Coast was on fire. And the fire complex that ran through all of these hills uh, was called the LNU Fire Complex and was caused by rogue lightning storms. It was, it was a ridiculous event. Now, the hills look kind of look green right now, but not nearly what they used to be. It's just because we're at the end of the rainy season. These hills used to be covered in oak forests. And that's what we're here to find today, oak tree. is pretty interesting. So if you look behind me, you'll see a dried out riverbed. Uh, this is here for a couple of reasons. One, it's the dry, it's a pretty dry winter, so we don't really have a lot of water action, but it's pretty big, isn't it? Well, a very, very long time ago, there used to be a big river that ran through here, and that was dammed up and helped create Lake Berryessa. However, there still needs to be river release. So to actually get to our trailhead, you go through one of two different uh, tunnels. These tunnels are huge. Not only do they allow for water to be released so it doesn't dam up back there, but it also provides an option for dam release. So if something were to happen, it wouldn't cause a lot of damage on the roads up above. And we continue to flow through here on the natural waterways. All right, let's go check it out. We might be here looking for oak trees, but there's another type of oak you have to watch out for out here. That's poison oak. Leaves of three, leave them be. They're a little shiny as you can tell and just now starting to turn red. The dominant species in the Solano Valley is the oak tree. Believe it or not, worldwide, there are over 500 different species of oak tree, which is pretty incredible. Oak trees are known for being very resilient, very hardy. They can survive natural disasters. I mean, look at all of the damage around me from a fire six months ago. Not much survived that fire, but oak trees are really bouncing back. They're one of the main plants to bounce back. It's because they are fire resistant plants. They burn, but they don't die. Think of it like a phoenix, they rise from the ashes. This is just a thing that I find interesting because I really like rocks and dirt. But if you take a look at the dirt mix here, it's not just dirt or eroded rocks. This is ash that's been mixed into the dirt, which helps fertilize the soil for the next generation of plants and foliage. Pretty amazing. Talk about a cycle of regeneration. It gets really dry out here, but on all hikes, remember to drink your water. Think back to when we talked about Ragnarok, the Norse end of times. According to the Norse end of times, you know, everything was destroyed. Not unlike where we are right now. But while the worlds are destroyed, the Yggdrasil tree remains and the new world would form around the Yggdrasil tree. And that's fairly similar to what we're seeing here. A lot of the foliage was burned to the ground, burned to ashes, isn't here anymore. But the oak trees, the world trees survived and helped to nurture the next generation of plants to populate the hills. Just adorable. What do you know about world trees, huh? Huh, buddy? The sheer resilience of oak trees had a huge impact on a lot of ancient cultures, from the Germanics to Baltics, which we'll get to later, and the ancient Greeks. Now, oak trees in Europe are huge. I mean, consider the oak tree behind me right now. This is a pretty big oak tree. 
But the difference with European oaks is that the trunks get a lot larger than the scrubby oaks that we have here in California. But I think you'll get the picture. Now, oak trees were sacred to the ancient Greeks and were representative of Zeus, the king of the gods. Now let's consider Zeus for a moment. There's tons of myths about Zeus, but the one we're going to talk about was written by Phyrocides of Syra. According to Phyrocides, Zeus married Gaia, the goddess of earth. So on the third day of the wedding, Zeus presented Gaia with a magnificent robe. The robe was decorated with imagery of the heavens, the earth, and the sea. And Gaia accepted this robe from Zeus. And by accepting this robe, she accepted her marriage to Zeus. This was huge cause for celebration. The pantheon of gods celebrated by feasting on ambrosia. And the earth, the mortar realm, what, which Gaia was goddess of, became like a winged oak tree, just as it was on her robe. The tree trunk was the earth, and the uh, roots stretched down into Tartarus, and the branches stretched up into Uranus, or the heavens. In this way, the oak tree became the world tree. It became the means to connect Uranus, the heavens, not Sailor Moon, but the heavens, the earth with the trunk, and the underworld below. Only a tree as resilient as an oak tree could represent the keen of the gods. Consider, consider this tree here. It just went through Ragnarok. You have a burn scar that runs all the way up the trunk. You have branches that seem dead. But if you look straight up, you see life in the foliage above. Even a huge, incredibly hot fire wasn't enough to kill this tree. And only a tree like this could represent Zeus. In fact, the connection between Zeus and oak trees is so strong that the Latin word for oak tree derives from the Greek word for lightning. You can't get a stronger connection than that. And the interesting thing about oak trees in Greek mythology is that the ancient Greeks believed that Zeus was able to communicate with his priests via the oak trees. So Zeus's main temple sat in a temple complex in Dodona, and in that temple was the sacred oak tree of Zeus. Now, all oak trees were sacred and were reminiscent of Zeus, but this was the big god. This was the Yggdrasil of Zeus oak trees. His uh, priests there were able to interpret the moving of the branches and the interaction of the tree with his environment to ascertain what Zeus was trying to tell him. People would travel from far and wide to visit the priests in Dodona to ask the sacred oak tree what Zeus wanted to gain wisdom and to gain direction on their life. This is the same thing that we see represented in the Tales games. You see your protagonists, Mint, Cress, and Lloyd and Colette, and they're given direction by communicating with the great summon spirits, which are akin to gods in the Tales games, through the world tree. In this case, the world tree of the oak tree. All right, so we've been able to get a gander at burnt oak trees. Let's go take a look at some ones that aren't burnt. Come on. All right, here we go, off to Lagoon Valley. Lagoon Valley is a large regional park that's located just outside of Vacaville, California. So it's just to the west of the foothills surrounding Berryessa. Um, the regional park actually used to be owned by a pioneering family, the Vaca family, and is actually home to their homestead, Vaca Pena. Um, we're going to be going above Vaca Pena into the hills, so I hope you brought your hiking shoes. We have a little bit of a hike once we get there. If you're enjoying the road trip, don't forget to like this video and subscribe.
surprise. Like I mentioned earlier, this is the very first virtual panel that I've put together. Uh, but I've been really enjoying it. This has been a project I've wanted to do for a long time. And I have over 10 years of panel material to work with. So I'm going to be uploading a lot more panels. There'll be some road trips like this, as well as some mini panels, you know, 15, 30 minutes long, things of that nature. So if you have any favorite games or fandoms or mythology or science concepts you'd like me to cover, go ahead and put a link in the comments and I would be happy to look into those. that gives Lagoon Valley its name. As you can see, it's uh, not been a very wet winter, so I'm actually in the lake bed itself. Those hills right behind me, that's where we were just at near Lake Berryessa. You can probably hear the freeway. The LNU fire complex went down those hills, just jumped the freeway before it was stopped. If the fire continued going, it would have hit into the rest of Lagoon Valley and the neighborhoods that are right behind it. For our oak world tree, we're going to be going hiking into the hills of Lagoon Valley. So let's get started. Looks like there is a track meet a lot of people here this evening. Time to be safe. I'm almost at the top of the ridge. There's a new rail, so I can take this off now. Whew. Had a bit of a climb. So we've been talking about world trees. And they fall into an ideology called Axis Mundi, which literally means center of the world. Now, Axis Mundi could be anything. It could be a tree, it could be a person, it could be a volcano, or it could be man-made. It could be a temple or a precipice or something like that. But the idea is that an axis mundi is central to preserving the world's life and is important in connecting different realms or different dimensions. All right, here's it comes some people. See you on the other side. All right, past my people on the trail. It's just so interesting that cultures all around the world that never had contact with each other all came up with this idea of Axis Mundi independently. And within that, it's even more interesting how many of them decided on trees to be their Axis Mundi. But I guess it makes sense, you know? Trees play a really important part. They're big, they're strong. And for a lot of cultures, they were their key to living, the key to survival. Lagoon Valley is just full of oak trees. And as you can see, these trees are very, very full, very, very lush bit of a different look compared to those trees near Berryessa that were all burned out. Now, I could talk about any of these trees, but I'm going to take you somewhere real special. I'm going up a hill that's locally known as Big Mama. This is the challenging part of local cross-country team uh, courses. It's just as hard as when I was in high school. So, we just came from there, across there, to cut around, to go up Big Mama. And now we're going to be going up this big hill over here. Yeah, that big one over there in the distance. The things I do for you people. was so strong you couldn't hear me on the video so I'm going to go find a more protected cool oak tree so we can check it out you can definitely hear the rustling in the wind 
the leaves and those branches. What do you think Zeus is trying to say? Three miles in, I finally found a cool oak tree in a protected area so you can actually hear me on the camera. Concept. I mean, I'm on a bit of a slope here, but close enough, we're good. So like I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of stories about world trees and oak trees. A lot of oak tree axis mundi. We already talked about the Greek oak world tree. So now we're going to go to Baltic and Slavic tradition. The oak tree was very important to them too and represented their world tree. Except unlike everywhere else, the world tree was inverted. The branches grew into the ground while the root went into the air. The tree lived on the edge of the world, so even though it was the center of the world, it was on the edge of that world, and connected the heavens, the earth, and the underworld. Now, similar to what we saw with Greek mythology, the Baltic and Slavic tradition also associated the oak tree with their god of thunder, which was their, one of their primary deities. Now, what's interesting about the Greek, Slavic, and Baltic traditions is this association of their world tree with an elemental. That's not something we've really seen in a lot of the others. It just was this cosmology, connect the universe sort of deal. But that kind of connects back to the Tales games. So in the Tales games, as you fully know, the world tree provides mana. And all of the elemental summon spirits are connected to the tree because of that. So when we saw the Yggdrasil tree get destroyed before, or the summon spirits went with it, which is why in Fantasia, during the present time, there were no summon spirits. But when Cress and Mint went back in time, there were. So kind of a fun association there. So we have one more stop to make on our Northern California road trip. Just give me a moment to hike back to the car. Here's a shout out to all of my Tales of Zillia fans. I'm bridging the worlds. I'm on the bridge. I made the bridge. Here we go, guys. California winter. Got my sweatshirt and my gloves. I might even have to wear a beanie later. We'll see. It's pretty cold. California redwoods are just incredible. These trees get so big. I mean, this looks like multiple trees all in one, doesn't it? Look, you can even go inside. So this is not a world tree per se, but you can see burn scars, just like what we saw with the oak trees outside of Winters near Berryessa. Time and time again, we see these trees just defy, uh, just defy nature and survive their own personal Ragnarok. It really is no wonder that these trees captured the imagination of people all across the world. Forest Redwoods isn't necessarily a small redwood grove. The preserve itself sits on 165 acres. However, it's not very well known. There's not really any signs for it. There's not really any parking lots. It's mostly just a place that locals go, which is kind of surprising considering its history. Now there's an interesting thing about all these world stories that we've been talking about is the idea that there are different worlds, but there are different worlds that intersect together. And you can't always see what that other world is. 
So here at Roy's Redwoods, this was one of the filming locations for Return of the Jedi. In fact, we're standing in the, on the moon of Endor. I'll let you know if I see any Ewoks. But you would never know if you watched the movie that you're literally right next to a road. And so just like the world trees, you don't necessarily see what the other world is. And you can't always see what's right next to you, what's connected. It's the same thing that we see here. You have a sci-fi world and you have a modern day road. Throughout our road trip, we have traveled back thousands and thousands of years to explore ancient lore of world trees. But the reason we went back in time is because of modern storytelling, because of modern video games. It's amazing to me how ancient stories and ancient trees can still inspire new stories and new lore today. Kind of like the group that I have right here. These trees inspired a brand new world, the world of Endor, something that had never been seen before. Trees today continue to inspire the imagination and connect us to different worlds. What started as ancient stories past word of mouth thousands and thousands of years ago have evolved and grown and integrated themselves into our modern day culture and our modern day lore. From the Nightmare Before Christmas to the tales of video games to so many more media and stories, these ancient myths continue to inspire us and continue to help build and integrate themselves into our mythos. While the events and the people, the civilizations, and the trees that originally inspired these stories have passed on, their impact remains and they continue to grow and evolve with us. Thank you so much for joining me for WYSIWYG Vision's very first virtual panel. If you liked what I did here, don't forget to subscribe and ring the notifications bell. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be doing more YouTube videos. I have a lot of content that I want to cover. If you have a subject or a fandom that you want me to address, leave a comment below and I'd be happy to look into it. Until then, enjoy the rest of Virtual Azalea and I'll see you around. Stay nerdy.